Thanks, Chuck. If, uh, if you want to know why I majored in philosophy, it's because the Air Force Academy didn't offer music. <laughs> so, uh, really, thanks for the introduction. And what, ladies and gentlemen, what an honor, Nuck uh, said it right, to be in a room of giants. What an honor and a privilege it is to, uh, to spend this evening with you. And I will tell you, I'm especially grateful that you were around when the first Jolly Greens deployed to Southeast Asia in 1965, which was the same year that my dad was flying F-4 Phantoms in Vietnam in the world-famous and highly respected Triple Nickel Fighter Squadron out of Udorn, Thailand. And as I understand the story, it was also in 65 that then Captain Barry Kamhoot took a barely mission-capable CH-3 into North Vietnam for three days taking fire every day in search of downed pilots. And when I say his plane was barely mission capable, I mean it had no radios, no navigation equipment, and several engine instruments were gone. But back then, you know, right? There were no written reports, no awards, <laughs> right? Just audacity and courage. And I'm proud to tell you that, uh, that, that, that your spirit, Barry, lives on in today's combat search and rescue airmen. And I stand here tonight as a testament to their courage, their dedication, being one more satisfied customer <laughs> who needed a ride home. Thank you. So of all the blessings of being the 21st Chief of Staff of the Air Force, I will tell you, certainly among the best for me is I get to travel and I get to visit airmen and I get to do this job as a team contact sport with my best friend and my high school sweetheart, Don. You know, our spouses, our spouses exhibit a very special kind of courage when they endure the long hours, the hardship, the separations, and very often the loneliness that comes with military service. And I'm one that believes that when it comes to service before self as a core value, I think it applies as much to our spouses as it does to those of us privileged to wear the uniform. You know, they take care of us so we can take care of the mission. And so I want to ask, if we could, a round of applause for our spouses that are here tonight. So there's no place that Dawn and I would rather be tonight uh, than celebrating with you on your final Jolly Green Gathering. You know, you put your blood, sweat, and passion into decades of serving others and truly embody the motto that others may live, like a future Chief of Staff of the Air Force. And Tom, thanks again for introduction, and it is good to be out of D.C., isn't it? <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, uh, you, as you know, I'm one of those pilots who has an odd number of takeoffs and landings. <laughs> when, I, uh, when I brilliantly intercepted an enemy missile with my aircraft. <laughs> and after that, somebody mentioned to me, they said, you know, you're supposed to be doing suppression of enemy air defenses, not depletion of enemy <laughs> air defenses. But that's where I found myself. In every combat pilot, you know, nightmare situation, right? You're all alone in enemy territory, miles inside of Serbia, and my life depended on a team willing to risk everything to come get me out. And there's a few airmen that are a part of this story, and I'll just mention three that mean a lot. Staff Sergeant Andy Kubik, Jeremy Hardy, and Senior Airman then, Ronnie Ellis. And Chief Bean is here tonight. Chief was also a part of that. Chief, where are you? There you are, Keith was right there. Yep. So these guys were playing spades in an alert, hurt, an alert hooch on the flight line of Tuzla Air Base when they got the word. Pilot down. And they did what they're trained to do. They geared up, they raced out to the helos. The crews were sent alert. Air crews spun them up, lifted off, ingress in enemy territory, unafraid that others might live. 
And our nation was not going to sleep that night until they brought me home. And once I determined that I was riding in a very expensive glider, <laughs> the decision was actually easy. Because the F-16 I was strapped to was going to hit the ground. The only question is whether I was going to be in it. So I gave one last radio call and pulled the handle. So, so a successful ejection from a, a combat aircraft, a high-performance aircraft, is actually, it's like a hundred unrelated miracles all coming together in about, about seven seconds. First the canopies fires, it has to clear the aircraft. Then the seat rockets fire. The G-forces for a high-performance ejection seat registers about 32 instantaneous Gs. That's 32 times the force of gravity. And yes, I was six foot three before this. <laughs> this is all that's left. So then if next a drogue chute comes out and it stabilizes you in the, in the slipstream, some gyros keep the seat upright, an altimeter determines when to release the parachute and it kicks you safely away from the seat. You think about that, any of those actions could fail with catastrophic results. But the team that maintained my jet that night was on it, and everything worked to perfection. And so as soon as I hit the ground, I gathered my bearings, I grabbed all my gear, and I ran to the nearest tree line. And I thought I would just you know, dart into the safety of this you know, ravine and tree line and sort of get my act together. But under the darkness, what looked like sort of flat terrain turned out to be a cliff. <laughs> so I looked like Wiley e. Coyote in that, you know, that cartoon where it was like I put the sign up and then whoosh, straight down. <laughs> but luckily I had my raft, which I had held in front of me, and I rode it like a sled, like Indiana Jones down this tree line, until I finally hit the bottom of the tree line. And then I got out my radio gear and I made a call to my wingman to tell him, I'm okay, and I'm on the move. So as I'm moving to, her, to higher terrain, I start hearing voices getting closer. So I hit the deck in some high grass as three Serbian soldiers started walking directly towards my position. And ever so slowly, I reached for my nine millimeter pistol because like any Texan worth his salt, I was going down swinging. <laughs> so I reach for my Beretta and I feel around and realize that during the ejection, my pistol left me. <laughs> or what the PJs would say was, it became gear adrift. <laughs> so there's some Serbian kids right now that got a great, nice, American-made 9mm Beretta that they got as a gift that night. But you know, you sort of always wonder, I think, could, it, could you do it? Could, you, could I, at close range, in very close personal combat, use a pistol or whatever I had to defend myself? Many of you have answered that question in combat. And what you get ready for is our training, right? Our training, for me, I went through SEER, or survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. I went through that training at the Air Force Academy in 1979, and I was shot down in 1999. I'll let you do the math. <laughs> so what we all know is what happens is our, our training is we compartmentalize it. Um, so it, we call it forward when it's needed. And I'll tell you the training that the enlisted Siri force, the instructors gave me 40 years ago, uh, came right back, like sort of like riding a bike. And there was no hesitation. If I had that 9 millimeter, and if I needed it, I would have used it. And so after realizing I had nothing to defend myself with, I did the next best thing, which was to hunker down and hug the earth <laughs> until these guys passed. And then I started moving towards high terrain. And once I got to this perfect position where I had a tree line behind me and a nice field to land the helo in front of me, I thought of the story of this buddy of mine that had jumped out of an airplane during some desert storm. And he spent six hours in, in Iraq hiding under his raft in a wadi while a rescue team uh, was working to get to him, six hours. And to keep his sanity, he would reach out from under the raft and he would scoop up rocks 
and he'd pull it into the raft and he'd use his, his red covered flashlight to go through the good rocks and he was collecting them for his kids. <laughs> because he wanted some souvenirs from them from Iraq. <laughs> and I remember when he debriefed me, I thought, that is father of the year. <laughs> I mean, picking out rocks for your kids in enemy territory. I mean, how cool is that? So now I find myself alone, waiting for a ride home, and I got time on my hands. So what do I do? I start picking up rocks. <laughs> So I got this little pile of rocks, and I'm building and sorting out the good ones for our daughters, and I'm putting them in my flight suit leg pockets, and all of a sudden I hear footsteps in the ravine behind me. And I remember thinking, darn, I can't believe they found me at 2 o'clock in the morning in this ravine, but I'm, I'm listening to the footsteps, and I realize that they're breaking branches, and I don't think it's human. I think it must be some kind of an animal. But it kept coming up towards me, and it got to a point where I thought it was sort of inside my personal space. So I reached down and I grabbed these rocks that I've been saving for my daughters, and I threw it at this thing, and it reared up on its hind legs and growled. And I will tell you, Jesse Owens could not keep up with me <laughs> as I left that perfect spot. And uh, while I am absolutely convinced, and I can look at each of you in the eye and tell you that that was either a mountain lion or a Serbian grizzly bear, my fellow fighter pilots are equally convinced it was a Serbian field mouse. <laughs> so we'll fast forward now to uh, the time that, uh, that Tom Kunkel and the Hilo teams comes in and they're getting ready to land. And so we're taught during Siri training that uh, you're supposed to be passive, right? Right? Uh, don't show a weapon, hold back. Let the recovery team come to you, authenticate you, because the team needs to know this not an ambush. Same training that, that, that you had in Vietnam. Well, as soon as the, the helicopter landed, the enemy opened fire, because they were in the area and they knew that I was close. And of course, the rotor, well, the rotor wash gave away our position. So the enemy is raking the tree line now with gunfire, and I start running towards the helicopter, and the PJs start running towards me, and our total authentication that night was, let's go. <laughs> so I jump into the helicopter, but I'm having a little trouble getting in because I got these rocks that are laid, <laughs> weighing me down in my flight suit. And then I get inside, and of course, we're taking rounds in the helo. We took five rounds in the helo that night. And, uh, and these PJs that are, you know, pretty good size, you know, folks, they got full body armor on, and they cover me because I was their precious cargo. And they had body armor on, and I didn't. And as we lift off, Nuck, I don't know if you know this, but the rocks in my flight suit went loose in the cockpit. And so I'm laying under these guys, and I'm trying to scoop these rocks up because I worked so hard to bring them home for my daughters. And as I were taking off, I think, man, these guys are heroes. These guys are incredible. And then it occurred to me, we're getting shot at from below. <laughs> I think I'm body armor for them. <laughs> so we land in Tuzla and we give all the participants, you know, high fives, big hug, and I jump on the C-130 and fly back to Aviano to get reunited with the family and, and back in the fight the next night. And so the, the folks that were part of that mission, from the two squadrons that were part, the 2-3 Special Tactics Squadrons and the 55th Rescue Squadron, um, they get a bottle of single malt scotch from me every year. I, and, I, uh, and they are praying I live a long and healthy life. <laughs> Because for me, you know, it's an opportunity to remind myself that every day I'm privileged to serve uh, as the chief is a chance to give back. And every day as I, as, is a chance to re-earn these stars because I wear them for these guys and the ladies that we get a chance to serve with. And I can't tell you, I can't be, I, I'm just so honored to serve every day as their chief. 
So Don, I'm going to ask you to join me on stage to help us deliver a 20-year-old bottle of scotch. And those of you who are scotch drinkers know that they make a lot of 18-year-old bottles of scotch. They make a lot of 21 year They don't make many 20-year-old bottles of scotch. So we actually had to do some searching. But uh, the two squadrons that picked me up, we've got a couple of reps. Uh, first of all, the commander of the 2-3 Special Tactics Squadron, Lieutenant Colonel Steve Cooper. And from the 55th Rescue Squadron, at Davis Mountain, Captain Paul Oates. So now is actually the highlight of the evening, because I get to introduce the love of my life and my best friend. She sent me off to war four times, and her daughter off to war in Afghanistan. She weathered Hurricane Hugo, pregnant and with a toddler, while her brave husband was off saving an aircraft. And this year, Don and I get the best call signs ever. Nana and Papa. <laughs> Later on at the bar, we have a 90-minute slideshow we'd like to share with you about our brain <laughs> or anybody who might be interested. But ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, an exceptional lady, a mom, a great Air Force spouse, our first lady of the Air Force, and my incredible wife, Dawn. Thank you. That was very sweet. I didn't expect that. What an honor it is to be here. And honestly, I'm very humbled to be one of your, uh, to be asked to speak. As a former school teacher, typically when I stand up in front of a group, I'm in a classroom, and everyone in that room is shorter than me. <laughs> Lucky for me, I have a husband who's given many speeches, and he gave me some great advice. He said, Don, because I asked him what I should say, and he said, there's no such thing as a bad, short speech. So that's my, that's my number one goal. Honestly, your community has held a special place in my heart for two decades now. Over the years, I've heard the many names involved in Dave's rescue mission but rarely had a face to match. And that changed about 10 years ago when my husband was invited to officiate the promotion ceremony of Senior Master Sergeant Jeremy Hardy to Chief. Then uh, when Dave received the invitation, he told me about it, and I didn't care if I had been invited or not. <laughs> I was gonna go. I finally got to hug some of the rescue warriors who were there on the night of my husband's shoot down. Airmen like Tom Kunkel, uh, Andy Kubik, Jeremy Hardy, Chief, excuse me, Chief Bean. Uh, it was a great ceremony. The party afterwards was fantastic. It was a barbecue on a deck overlooking the Gulf here in this area, surrounded by beautiful people eating delicious food. It was a great evening. A couple hours into it, Dave leaned down and he said, Dawn, it's commander departure time. <laughs> That's when the commander leaves the party <laughs> early, and then the party really gets started. <laughs> and I said, hmm, let's think about this. You're the commander. I'm not. <laughs> You're the general. I'm not. <laughs> You're driving. Can you pick me up in a couple of hours? <laughs> Just when the fun seemed to be subsiding, Dave and I got to go sailing on the Hardy's yacht, an impressive 47-foot sailboat. Oh my goodness, what an experience. The boat was huge. It was gorgeous. We were served adult beverages in cute crystal-style glasses 
sailing around, enjoying the company, the sun, the water. What a fabulous day. The euphoria stayed with us for weeks after we got back to Langley, which is where we were at the time. Sometime later, we got in. Dave said, let's go, to, you know, let's go, go sailing. So we get in our 1979 27-foot hunter, a fixer-upper, on the water. <laughs> After sailing in the Hardy's boat, I thought we, I felt like we were the three men in a tub with our chin, <laughs> with our chin, you know, our knees up to our chin. And our adult beverage was served in a red solo cup. <laughs> and the thought occurred to me. I said, Dave, you goofed. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, look, if you'd been a chief, and the rescue squadron. We could have a boat like Jeremy. <laughs> Tonight, I want to share some things you may not know about Dave and talk about your successful rescue on May 2nd of 1999. I'll focus on the spouse's perspective to fill in, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. As Dave said, we're high school sweethearts, going back 43 years now. We've been married 36 years. And as he said, our, we are most proud to be brand new grandparents. We embraced the Air Force life because we actually grew up that way. Dave's father was Air Force and my stepfather. This is the only life we've ever known. When Dave took command of the Triple Nickel Fighter Squadron, in July of 1998, I couldn't believe he had gotten that old. <laughs> it was actually a very interesting time back then, because the squadron was preparing to go to war in Kosovo. You might have remembered Milosevic and the genocide and the horrific things that were going on. The schedule in the squadron was very grueling. Long nights. Um, or rather late nights, long hours, and on the weekends, and I know you know what that's about. It was really difficult for some of the spouses in the squadron, specifically our younger spouses. So I told Dave it was wearing them down, and he said, Don, I can't tell you when we'll get the call to go into Kosovo, but what I can tell you is when it might be a good night to have a pot luck. <laughs> Time went on, and one day I was headed out the door to pick up our daughters from swing excuse me, swim practice, and the phone rang. It was Dave. Hey, babe, tonight's a good night for a pot luck. Got to go. <laughs> Click. I thought, oh my goodness, this is it. I called a friend to pick up our daughters. And then I called the D.O. spouse and said, Sharon, I got a hankering for a potluck. I know it's late. Let's tell the ladies, bring the kids, bring whatever you have in the refrigerator or whatever you're making for dinner, and come on over to the house. And I looked at my watch, and it's about 3.30, and I thought, oh, none of these spouses will come. Well, we did the, the old phone tree. So between the two of us, we contacted all the spouses. Do you think any of them came? A hundred percent of them came. They were hungry for news. It, we were fortunate that Dave was able to leave the squadron a little bit late, later that evening, and he came in to give a little pep talk. And he told his spouses, <clears throat> excuse me, that the pilots were ready, and the maintainers had maintained those aircraft. They were pristine. And they, and they were excited to be able to go into combat. It was the first night of combat. And we spouses were actually thrilled to be a part of it somehow. We walked out into the front lawn with a glass of wine in our hand <laughs> and enjoyed the first launch ever that, of that campaign. 24 F-16s in full afterburner, and they flew over our house. It was awesome. Several days into the campaign, this sort of became our new normal. Dave would fly all night, come home, eat dinner, just as our girls were eating breakfast. 
They would go off to school, he'd go to sleep. They'd come home from school, he'd eat his breakfast, they'd eat their dinner, and then he'd go fly. That was the cycle for most of the pilots in the squadron. And the whole time I never slept very well. On day 39, I woke up at 1.45 a.m. with a sick feeling that something was wrong. I wasn't worried about safety, but petty theft in Italy at the time was a problem. I walked around the house, turning on all the lights, and I walked outside. I thought somebody might be lurking around. Every, nothing was amiss. I went back to bed, but not to sleep. At 5.30 a.m., the phone rings. It was the wing commander, Brigadier General Dan Leith at the time. And he said, Don Goldfein, it's good news. Itsu, that's his wife at the time, and the team will be at your house in 10 minutes. Click. In 10 minutes, I got dressed. I made coffee, because why wouldn't you? And I slipped up the living room. Why wouldn't you? There wasn't a Barbie to be found after I was finished. It was the Tasmanian Devil Act. The whole time I was praying because I knew the team was coming to get me to take me to another spouse, to her house, to comfort her. I knew her husband was alive, but I didn't know what shape he was in. And I prayed that I would say and do the right thing for her. Then the doorbell rang. And at the door when I opened it was Itsu, the wing commander's spouse, the ops group commander and his spouse, the med group commander, the chief of flight medicine, and this is what gave it away. Our priest, Father Marty, walked up the sidewalk. I knew at that moment it was Dave. They said, Don, Dave's been shot down over Serbia. And I asked what only any fighter pilot wife would ask. How's this jet? <laughs> <laughs> I invited them in. And so I've been told, because I don't honestly remember, I served them coffee. We sat in the living room. We talked. I don't remember what we talked about. I knew stories of other pilots who had to eject, and it didn't go well. The, the call finally came. I told him I had to wake up our daughter. Our youngest daughter spent the night with a friend. Our daughter was in the sixth grade at the time. I had to tell her that something had happened to her dad, that we needed to get dressed, and we were going to go meet him, meet the aircraft. We sat in, our, in Father Marty's car, and we prayed on our way to the flight line. And when we arrived, it was like, out of my peripheral vision, a sea of green was floating in around us. All these uniforms, maintainers, pilots, you name it, everybody was coming to the flight line to see this aircraft land. When the C-130 finally landed and the stairs were lowered, Dave walked down the stairs, a muddy mess. It was the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. After I hugged Dave, our very patient and well-disciplined daughter got to hug her daddy. After she hugged him, she never left his side. An interesting fact that I learned later, and as God is my witness, they were shot down at 1.45 a.m. that day, that morning, the exact time I woke up. I'll never forget the first time I saw your motto of the rescue community. It was at the 23rd Rescue uh, excuse me, Special Task Tactics Squadron. It's painted on the wall as you walk in that others may live. 
I can hardly wrap my brain around that. Your fearless history embodied in the motto that others may live has a far deeper meaning to me. That others may live. That a best friend may live. That a husband may live. That a father may live. That a grandfather may live. As just one spouse who has benefited greatly from your courage and your professionalism, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. I'm saving for a bigger boat. <laughs> so it's all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll, just, I'll just, we'll just finish and just say what an honor it is for us to be with you tonight. May God bless this great nation and the long blue line, past, present, future, that always have and always will defend her. It's an honor for us to be with you tonight. Thank you very much.